Right, so you see that on your screen. Um, so if you just click um, continue and that you're okay um, with being recorded, you can also, um, to just to let you know, if you shut off your camera, um, you won't be seen in the video, but you will still, if you speak, um, you will, you, what you say will be recorded during, during that process. So just to let you, you know that. Okay. All right, so at this meeting, um, we do have uh, ASL um, interpreters. Um, you can see of uh, the interpreters in our participant list, their names are Lisa uh, Dennett and Lisa Scalia. I apologize if I uh, mispronounce your names. Um, for those of you who need the ASL interpretation, you can pin um, their videos so it's focused on them at all times. Um, let us know in the chat uh, if you need a ASL interpretation and we can uh, make it so you can pin both interpreters um, and the speaker at the same time. So uh, if you need that, um, that service, it is available. Shamika, can I just add, add something to that though? So just make sure it's that you need it because the tech does limit the amount of people that can have that access. So not, not just because you like it or find it interesting, it's if you need it, please right. request it. If you don't need it, please don't request it, okay? Yeah, yeah we wanna make sure that it's, it's there for the people that actually do need it, okay. All right, and this, this um, just shows you how you can uh, do pinning at, at the, on your computer, if you're on a computer. It's at the uh, top of the meeting window. You hover over the video of the participant you want to pin, and then you click pin. So you look for the names of the, um, the, the uh, interpreters, and then that will, or the speaker, and that will pin their video. So your video will always be focused on them. Okay, so to pin a video on a tablet or a smartphone, what you do is you swipe to your left, you uh, double tap the person and then double tap again to unpin. Okay. Again, like I said, we have lots of people behind the scenes helping with different things. So if you have any tech issues or tech uh, need tech support, we have Evan and Sue who are helping behind the scenes and this is how you contact them if you're having any, um, any tech needs um, during this time. And as uh, Arnold said, if you have, you know, something happens with your internet or whatever, um, you know, you can always just sign back in, everything's fine, you know, things happen sometimes. Okay, so I am going to go, turn it over to Robert Terry, who are board, who is a board member from our Capital Hudson Valley region. And he is going to review today's agenda. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Robert Terry. Um, I'm the board member for the Lower Hudson Valley and the, and the Capital region, but I practically live in the Hudson Valley. Nice to meet you all. So today I'm gonna to review the agenda. At 1 p.m., we're gonna do introductions and announcements. 115 speaker, keynote speaker, Judy Hammond, disability rights leader. At 2.05 p.m., we will have a break. At 2.15, how to talk to legislators and directors panel discussion. At 3.15 p.m., we will have afternoon announcements. At 3.30, we will have a break. At 3.15, afternoon announcements. At 3.30, we'll have a break. At 4.15, 
We will have networking and breakout groups. 4.45 p.m., we will have another break at, for like one to two hours. At 6 p.m., we will have evening introduction and announcements. 6.15, we will have uh, memorial at 6.45 p.m., how I made the P PB and J show with BJ, the Saney's president, board president. 7.45 p.m., open mic, which you get all the discussed things like questions or open mic, this, like more like an open floor like we did last year. And at 8.30 p.m., viewing of Crip Camp. Thank you, Robert. Um, so that is the agenda for today. And so with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to our president, BJ Stasia, who is going to introduce our keynote. Thank you, Shamika. Before we get into our conversation with Judy, Sophia, can you pull up the trailer for everybody? Sure can. Thank you. One moment so that it comes out right. Can I say a little something while you're about to put it up? Sure, Judy. Sure. Hello, everybody. Very glad that you're all here today. Hopefully, we can meet again in the future in person, shake each other's hands, and have discussions. I think some of you have seen this film uh, called Crip Camp, and others of you may see it this evening. It is about a camp for disabled people um, that was in Hunter, New York. So some of you may know where Hunter, New York is. And uh, it is what's called a documentary, meaning that it's a film which is factual and it uh, has people who are talking about many different issues. And one of the important parts of this film is people who have disabilities talking about problems that we have and work that's being done over the last many years to help end discrimination against disabled people. And I think many people, disabled and non-disabled people, really like this film because people are learning things that they didn't know about before. And so what Sophia is gonna show is only a little more than two minutes. So for those of you who have seen the film, um, it'll be a reminder. And for those of you who have not seen it, hopefully it'll make you want to see it. And if you didn't see it last week or today, you can see it on Netflix and YouTube. So thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. What, you want me to tell them what happened? <laughs> well, two people got cramps and they're spreading. <laughs> we were all very hyper about it. And I have to go shower some people. I'll see you later. I wanted to be part of the world, but I didn't see anyone like me in it. I hear about a summer camp for the handicapped run by hippies. Somebody said, you probably will smoke dope with the counselors. And I'm like, sign me up. Have to catch Jeanette and find yourself. There I was. I was in Woodstock. You wouldn't be picked to be on the team back home, but at Jeanette, you had to go up the back. Even when we were that young, we helped empower each other. It was allowing us to recognize that the status quo is not what it needed to be. The world always wants us dead. We live with that reality. At the time, so many kids just like me were being sent to institutions. It was just a continual struggle. Most disabled people, like myself, are unable to use public transportation. We needed a civil rights law of our own. A rehabilitation program has been vetoed by the president because it was cost prohibitive. We decided we were going to have a demonstration. You get the call to action to the barricades. A small army of the handicapped have occupied this building for the past 11 days. So many people from Camp Jeanette found their way into the building. The FBI cut off the phones. The deaf people went, we know what to do. That's how we communicated to the people outside the building. The Black Panther Party would bring a hot meal. We were like this. We are the strongest political force in this country. We will no longer allow the government to oppress disabled individuals. 
and I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. What we saw at that camp was that our lives could be better. If you don't demand what you believe in for yourself, you're not going to get it. I said You like to see um, the handicapped people depicted as people. Excuse me? <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Sophia. Judy, we're going to go into me asking you questions now, if that's OK. Of course. It's good to see you again, by the way. Nice to see you again. And I've seen the movie again five times since we talked last because it oh, really? inspires me and lifts me up, you know? Yeah. So what was, that, what was that camp experience like for you? Well, um, how many of you ever went to camp or still go to camp? Can I see you raise your hand? Uh, okay, so quite a number of people. And unfortunately, we can't have an open discussion about it now, but um, camp for me was a lot of fun. Uh, I started going to camps when I was nine. And when I was about 12, I started going to this camp, Jeanette. What I liked about it was I was away from family. I was able to be learning more about how to be more independent, even though I needed the same amount of help at camp than I did at home and in some ways maybe even more because in my house things were you know more accessible to me and at camp it was you know not the bathrooms for example were not set up for each individual person but for rather the group but it was great to be able to make new friends be able to have interesting discussions, talking about as teenagers, what we wanted to do as we were growing up and also learning that other disabled people were having problems like I was. So it was great to be able to meet people who um, had similar goals of wanting to be able to um, live in the community, be able to use public transportation, go to school, get jobs, and uh, to talk about not just what the problems were, but um, what we needed to do to make things better. And of course, one of the other important parts of camp is people dated, we had girlfriends, boyfriends. Um, it was a way of doing things in many ways that we couldn't do when we lived in the city. And in the movie, you were asking about the food everybody wanted in the mess hall area. Do you remember what food they actually chose? Uh, we had to have lasagna. Oh, I was wondering about that. So I love lasagna. So we never had uh, lasagna at my camp. So I wish I went to Camp Jeanette. Oh, well, once a week, if the chef, if the cook was on, you know, day off, we would all have to pitch in and make a meal for the entire camp. Someone here wrote that they started going to camp in 2007. So you're younger than I am, but I started going to camp probably in like 1956. Yeah, 56, 57. And I went to camp for many years. So was that discussion you were having around the table with Steve, Steve Hoffman and the rest of the people kind of the impetus for the advocacy that all you guys did? I would say that the discussion around the table was definitely uh, an example of what we were doing learning from each other 
listening to each other. And you know, the discussion around the table was a lot around our families, our parents, Nancy Rosenblum talking about overprotection from her family um, and Stevie and Stevie Hoffman. Uh, Nancy, Stevie and I went to the same elementary school. So we were with each other during the year and then in the summer. And um, it definitely that table discussion was an example of how we gain strength from each other. And um, what made you decide to start Disabled in Action? I found that very interesting when you blocked up the streets of New York City. So we I, already had Disabled in Action. Yeah, myself. That so Disabled in Action started um, in 1970. And it really came about because of many, a number of things. One, I was denied my job as a teacher and um, other disabled people were facing different kinds of discrimination and in employment and other areas. And um, there were some articles in a number of newspapers in New York City, the New York Times, the New York Post, the Daily News, and about my being discriminated against and about my going to court. And uh, with the newspapers taking a position that the Board of Ed should give me my teaching license. So that was um, very important. And we were getting letters and phone calls and people were really interested. So we decided to have a meeting at Long Island University in Brooklyn and invite all the people that had sent in letters or had called or met on the street, you know, my brother's having this problem, whatever it might be. And we invited people to this meeting at Long Island University, which is where I went to college. And about 80 people came, which quite frankly, uh, in 1970 was a lot of people because, you know, transportation wasn't accessible. And um, we met and decided to form Disabled in Action, and that's how it happened. Awesome, and when you guys did the sit-in, when the, de the deaf community was passing messages back and forth, did you guys laugh? Because I'm sure nobody else knew what was going on. Um, I think we saw it as problem solving because we were, you know, like many disabled people, kind of resilient and people put up uh, barriers and we figure out how to break them down. So in the film, uh, you see that there were people with all types of disabilities who were participating in the demonstrations. And it was because of that when uh, we need to figure out how we were gonna communicate with people outside the building, that this gentleman who you see in the film was in a wheelchair signing. His, his name was Dale Dole, unfortunately he passed away. But Dale was born deaf. And it was later in his life that he was hit by a car and became a triplegic. And so he had started getting involved with the Berkeley Center for Independent Living and CIL was one of the leaders in the um, demonstrations in, in the federal building. So, and he also had deaf friends and they got involved. And you could see how the movement really was expanding. And um, so when uh, you guys were working on 504, not much was accessible. Like what was the most difficult thing for you as far as accessibility? Well, at that time, there were not very many accessible bathrooms. So in movie theaters, in restaurants, at the airports, um, unless you lived in a state like New York, 
where there might have been a law that was stronger than what existed in the federal level, um, it was really difficult. And because 504 did not cover the private sector, meaning that you know, if a new building was being built and it only had, it didn't have any government money, any federal money, they did not have to comply with accessibility standards unless they were in a state like New York that might have already had standards in place. But for many, many states that wasn't true. And so um, really, you know, what was very important was for us to be telling our stories about the barriers we were facing. So, you know, you'd go to the movie theater and they could tell you how to get out of your wheelchair because they didn't have wheelchair seating. You wouldn't drink for a long time if you were going out because you couldn't use the bathroom. Uh, those were some of the big issues. And the buses and the trains were not accessible. So the barriers for people with physical disabilities, many of you have physical disabilities, uh, really were very significant. What would you tell somebody, Judy, if they're worried about telling their story and the fact that their story might upset people and make them angry if they want them to really make something accessible? Because I can tell you there are still some things which need to be worked on, but that's why Sani's and your work is so important because we're all advocating for what we what we want and not everything is accessible. So what would you, you tell somebody when telling your story to make it it's important for people when you tell your stories is to talk not only about good things but about problems and uh, whatever they may be. You don't like where you're living, you want to be more integrated, you don't like your job, you want to look for a different job, you want a job, you don't have a job, whatever these things are. The food that you're eating isn't what you want. You know, it depends on, uh, you know, your own personal story, but identifying things that you want to change, I think is very important. And um, thank you. Welcome. Hey, Julie this, Julie, this is Michelle. We're not done yet, Michelle. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I think we'll open it up to questions now. I can tell everybody's excited to ask you questions. So let's jump right into that. Sorry about that, PJ. Well, Shelly's the first person, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you're right on time there, Shelly. Am I on time? You're right you're on time. You're always on time, Shelly. You're always on time. Why do, why do, why don't people like calling our homes group homes? And can you share your view and issues about it? I really, it really bothers me when people say this is a group home. So Shelly, where do you, excuse me. How many people live where you live? Right now there's only four, but it bothers us when people call it a group home. What bothers you about it? I just don't like the word group putting into the word home and I just don't like being called a group home. Well, I think you should tell people that. You should tell it. It's tell people it's your home. I think one of the reasons why it's called group home is probably because it's in legislation. And oh, it's, it's in the law. It gets complicated. You get money probably for where you live from Medicaid. And mm -hmm. um, there are certain requirements. And um, we, it, it, you know, there's been a lot of work being done so that people can live in smaller homes with, you know, fewer people. Um, but what I think is important, Shelley, is you need to let people know what you feel 
So if you don't want them to call your home a group home, I don't. Just, then you just tell them, I live in a home. I have three roommates. Please don't call this a group home. No, I rather I rather call it a home than a bunch of people putting the word word on the end of group home because to me that upsets me. We're we're considered people and we're considered individuals, but when you put the word group on to the end of home, it should be called the home. So you don't like being called a group because no. No, okay. I do not. Well, then you tell people what you believe. You say, excuse me, I live in, this is my home. It's not a group home. Yeah, because people always put that on the end. And we don't want to be labeled a group home. We want to con consider this our home. Good. Awesome question, Shelly. Thank you. Robin Golden, you're up next. Yes, Judy. Um, I was wondering, with, with your opinion, what kind of disability issues do you think we had um, in the past and the future, and what can we do to um, continue to solve them? Okay, I'm trying to find you. Hold on. Can you raise your hand? Whoever. Here, I'm okay. Him oh, you know what? You are right in front of, you're right behind the chat. So when people write, um, I see the writing, not your face. So you get called Robert? Yes, my name is Robert, yes. So Robert, could you please repeat your question for me? What kind of disability issues do you think we had in, in the past, in the future? And what can what can we do to um, solve some of them? Okay, so can I ask you a question? Yes. So tell me, what do you think? What are some of the problems that you're trying to address? Um, probably transportation. Um, problems with COVID. Um. So maybe why don't we for a minute talk about? transportation what are the problems that you're facing um always having to be on a schedule um not enough room on buses are you um, you talking about regular buses yes um is there a committee where you live for where do you live robert syracuse Oh, you're in Syracuse. Um, so the buses in Syracuse are accessible, but it's difficult for you well, to get on them. They, they are, but they don't have too many accessible seats. This is about in the hallway for you. How many do they have, like two? Yes. Yeah, so that's really um, a design issue. And, you know, something you may want to be doing is um, seeing if there's a committee in Syracuse, a transportation committee, um, and maybe you could either become a member of the committee or learn about when they have their meetings and when maybe now during COVID they're doing virtually, but I think you should with other friends uh, go and speak about what is working and what is not working. All right, thank you. Yeah, and I would like to say it's a great question. And um, so you mentioned COVID also. What are, I mean, what are some of the problems for you around COVID? Just staying home, not having a lot to do, um, and people not respecting the social distancing rules and wearing masks. So there are many things that you said. So let's break it apart. Um, people that are not social distancing and are not wearing masks, that makes you feel angry? Yes. So is there like a local community newspaper? Yes. So maybe um, you could write or you could get someone to help you write 
something called a letter to the editor. Do you okay. know what that is? Yes. So maybe you could just write a letter to the editor that says, you know, I am a disabled, I and mean, you'll say whatever you want, but you know, I'm a disabled person. I'm affected by COVID like everybody else. And it makes me very upset when people are not social distancing and wearing masks because it allows the virus to spread more. And um, I would appreciate it if people followed the rules, whatever, but write something, A, because that makes you feel better probably, you know, and if they print it, that would be great. And then you're speaking not just for yourself, but there are other people who feel like you. All right, thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Robert. That was an awesome question. Uli Ramos, you're up next. Yeah, and welcome again to, to be here. My question is, I heard that you work with Ed Fund, Funders. I was wondering Sorry, what you talk about. I heard that you talked to El, Ed Fund. Fanas, one of, I'm sorry, Ed Roberts, uh -huh. what do you guys talk about when, when you were doing all this? So Ed Roberts is a friend of mine. He passed away, as you probably know, yes. in 1995. Um, I met him in 1973. Uh, what do we talk about? You know, we talked about many things. Uh, we worked together for many years. And Ed was the one that invited me to come to California from Brooklyn. So, um, you know, we, we were interested in similar things. We uh, were interested in working towards um, empowering disabled people. Um, Ed became the director of the Department of Rehabilitation in California after he and a number of other people started the Berkeley Center for Independent Living. And, um, I was working at the Center for Independent Living in, Ber in Berkeley. So we talked about everything that didn't have anything to do with disability. So going out to a restaurant and, you know, meeting with friends and he had a lovely dog uh, for a number of years and taking the dog out for a walk and just doing fun things. Um, and then we did a lot of work together. So our work was really, we traveled to different parts of the United States. We traveled to other countries and uh, we would talk with people about what we were doing both in Berkeley and in the United States. We were working on different laws. Uh, we were doing coalition work. Um, yeah, we had, it, it was, he was a very dear friend. Thank you. And Thank work you. on when, again. When did you did you ever meet Ed or no? No, I just read about him to uh, one of our one hours uh, uh, I read about him, and I was just curious. And so by mention that you knew him and you work with him, and I was just I was just curious to find out what you guys talk about. Yeah, we kind of talked about everything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Lee. That was an awesome question. Jessica Campbell, you're up next. Hi, hi, Judy. My name is Jessica. Um, hi. Over the course of my life, which I am now 47, I have seen lots of growth within disability services, from medical technology to um, adaptive technology and communication technology. Because, like when I was, in, like back in the 70s, there was these big metal braces. You had walk like standing boards things like that. So over the time, that's time I have seen um, um, communication devices such as um, and adaptive tech and medical tech evolve um, and expand. Um, where, do, as, as far as getting um, inclusion and ADA involved in the legal framework of this country, where do you see um, disability services in the next five years? Uh, very interesting question. Thank you. Um, well, there are many different ways to answer that. When we look at technology, when we start out looking at braces, you know, as you were saying, um, 
the kinds of metal and plastics that are available today that, for example, were not available in the 1950s when I started wearing braces. You know, they were heavier, um, but now the technology, as you said, is so very different. Um, and it allows us to use things that are lighter and more flexible and enable us to do more things. Technology, like in computer technology, is like so different. Um, and we see like almost every day, new developments in um, our smartphones, our computers, our social media, everything. It's on some level way beyond me. You know, I just, you know, am learning how to use it and struggling to me learn too. about all the things that are going on. But I think one of the important aspects of what's happening, for example, let's take the autonomous cars. Like when we were growing up, whoever thought that there really were going to be cars that could be driven without a person doing the driving. Like that was kind of Flintstones or- I mean, I left to I grew up in the generation with standing boards. Yeah. And so these are things that are now coming to become reality. Now there's been a lot of work um, because under the Obama administration, a woman named Maria Town uh, got the White House involved uh, with the autonomous cars that were being developed. And that meant that Disabled people almost in the beginning of the planning for these cars got involved, which has been very important because one of the things that frequently goes on is as new things are being developed, disabled people are not necessarily involved. And where we're not involved, that means that the accessibility may not be what it could have been. So I think it's very important that uh, people are knowledgeable about accessibility for disabled people, that disabled people like yourself are really involved. So as designing is happening, people can talk to us and say, what is it that you need? And then we can also be involving disabled people who are scientists and um, working in the area of technology and are knowledgeable and expert and also have disabilities and can benefit from what is being developed. So. The inclusion, well, many things. The education of disabled people from elementary school on up so that we know people are learning more in math and science and technology um, needs to be happening. And we need to be at the tables with companies as plans are being developed for new types of technology. Um, and we need to be involved in the design and implementation. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Jessica. Awesome question. I'm going to hand it over to our moderator facilitator for this portion of the conference, Shamika, to get the other questions going. All right. So we have a list of people um, that um, have questions for Judy. So we'll call you one at a time. Make sure everyone else is muted, stays muted so people can clearly answer their questions, uh, ask their questions. Okay, so first up we have Danielle as a question for Judy. Hi Judy, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm familiar with your work during the Clinton administration and the development of the ADA. I'm particularly interested in getting legislation going when it comes to making changes within doctor's offices most specifically getting at least one doctor's exam room to have a fully height adjustable exam table. Because as it is right now, I'm suffering from multiple medical issues that require hands-on examination. And to be able to get in the appropriate position sometimes is nearly impossible. And my parents are aging, they're 72 and 74 respectively. So in order to be lifted like six foot high is becoming a real struggle. And I just wanted to know where you think this could possibly go and how do I go about mandating legislation? Well, I would say 
that there are a number of things which are going on now. Um, first of all, I would look at the Americans with Disabilities Act um, and language there about what is um, permissible and what is not permissible um, as far as medical treatment is concerned. So for example, um, you know, maybe going to doctors that are affiliated with hospitals might, as opposed to private doctor's offices, um, because the private doctor's offices are, I mean, there is no money for these people to do things like get a wheelchair accessible scale or get an accessible exam table. Um, and I think there really needs to be financing certainly to help private doctors be able to get this. Or at least grant, grant funds. Sorry? Or at least like some type of um, federal grant in each state. Well, something like that. Whether the federal government gives money to the states or the states put money in, yes, something like that. Um, and we're also talking about training. And there's an entity called the US Access Board and they have been working on standards for medical technology, for exam tables and for um, mammograms, for example. Um, now in some of the bigger hospitals, I know that they have Hoyer lifts. So to be able to get you know, onto an exam table or to get a CT scan or um, an MRI for some people who can't transfer and can't easily be lifted, Hoyer lifts in the hospitals are very helpful. So, and ultimately I think, you know, it's looking at the community that you're living in, working with other disabled people, um, getting, you know, county government and city government potentially involved in the state government too. But I think really understanding what the law requires. The other thing is, um, I think, you know, maybe, depending on you know, whether you have one or more hospitals in the area that you live, yeah, uh, well, really, sorry? I live in the Bronx, so. Oh yeah, plenty. We're affiliated with Montefiore and um, uh, Montefiore. Well, North is so are you home. having problems with them? There were issues, uh, there's issues. Uh, there are issues, definitely there are issues. There are issues. Uh, because right now they still require my father to lift me. And when you ask them for assistance is, I don't know if we could do that. And Tell them you're gonna file a complaint. But more importantly, I think what you should do is speak to the administrator in a hospital. And, you know, not just go by yourself if you can, but, you know, maybe get some other people or the Center for Independent Living in the Bronx. Do you do any work with them? I'm not affiliated with them, no. You know what they are? I'm aware of what they are, yes. Well, you know, I'm I might call with them. them. I would call them and I would tell them this is a problem and this is what you've experienced. And could they help you? Um, I've had that problem, you know, here at a facility where they didn't want to lift me and I did file a complaint. And uh, whenever I go now, I mm -hmm. call in advance and I tell them I'm going to need assistance. Mm -hmm. um, and this particular place that I went to did provide me with the assistance. But I learned later that it wasn't necessarily consistent. But then when I go to a hospital here, uh, I go to some place called Sibley, and they're, you know, they're bigger. And they will either help me or they have a Hoyer lift um, to do okay. that. So. I think it's an important problem. Your parents absolutely should not have to do this. It is their responsibility. And, but as I said, uh, work with the, the um, Bronx CIL or you belong to any other organizations like United Cerebral Palsy or any groups. I'm on, I've, I was a former student at ECP in uh, Stillwell Avenue, so. I mean, this is not a problem just for you, Danielle. And yeah. I think that's one of the important things. These types of issues are problems for many people. And yes, we have to 
you know, fight for ourselves. We get an appointment. We have to go to the doctor. We need to make sure we're going to get the help that we need. But if we know that it's a bigger problem, then I think it's really getting other organizations. Go to Montefiore and say, not alone, but with other people or a letter and then a meeting uh, with the administrator, administrator of the hospital and say, our experience have been that disabled people coming from medical services are not being treated appropriately. You're not regularly assisting people in getting on and off exam tables, whatever it may be. We want a meeting to discuss you know, what you are doing and what changes are gonna be put in place or we're gonna file a complaint. Something like Zephra, that. Zephra, if you can hear me, I think uh, this is something we need to work on in the group. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, Danielle, I don't mean to cut you off, but we wanna to get to as many people Okay. Thank you, Judy. That's a great question. I have a question. Matthew, walk away. Uh, can I just jump in really quick to, to Danielle? So, so Danielle, I know you're pretty involved with Sandy's in our New York City office too. So, you know, you connect with our New York City office too and see, you know what I mean? We have our regional meetings every month and we, you know, yes, but, uh, but Arnold, but Arnold, uh, I've been doing this since 2004. So there's no, there's no good, you know what I mean? So Arnold, who are you? Oh, sorry, Judy, this is Arnold. We, we met a couple weeks Hi. ago. I'm the administrative yeah, director. I can't see yeah, my camera's off, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'll, put it, I'll put it on. But yeah, yeah, so I was just saying to Danielle there as well, you know, talk, uh, you connect with the New York City office as well. We have the regional meeting with all the self-advocates, you know, once a month. So you know, maybe, it, what, maybe what you could do, Arnold, since this is a known problem, that maybe before the next meeting, you or someone could actually call Montefiore and explain that this is a problem that's been brought to your attention and what can be done about it. And then maybe well, you could, for the next meeting, be able to talk about what's gonna happen because they're clearly in violation. Yeah. But, uh, I would talk to P&A. Uh, Judy, uh, may I introduce a little bit? May I say something? I've been, doing the, I've been dealing with the issue statewide because they moved the, the Medicaid office to Albany in uh, 2004, okay? So since they moved the state uh, the, the funding to Albany, everybody's uh, uh, is, uh, being uh, let, uh, called, let back. So it's been an issue since 2004. Every have in 2004. Okay. Well, I think what's good about this conversation and this kind of a conversation needs to happen regularly is that, you know, you have people mm -hmm. on this call who know, mm -hmm. who are involved with organizations that can really make these problems be brought to the public's attention. Mm -hmm. And so Arnold and somebody else, I don't know who they were, just wrote in and said, I think to Danielle that, you know, they'll talk to you next week, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, mm -hmm. listing out what we call, you know, low hanging fruit, and broader problems. So low hanging fruit, in my view, is something like you go to a hospital and they're not helping you transfer. That's a low hanging fruit. And it also means you wanna know what the hospital is doing to train you know, their staff because you get there and somebody is saying, no, they can't do that. That's all wrong. And the administrator needs to address those issues. And they need to make sure people are being trained on it and other issues that you all define. Awesome, this is an awesome video. Yeah, Shamika, um, her internet went out. So the next she had called me to ask uh, the call on the next person, Ed. Ed is the next person. So, and thank you, Danielle. And, uh, You're welcome. Hi, Judy. Uh, to get back to your first uh, comment. Yes, I have done a presentation here in uh, Binghamton, uh, Binghamton University on uh, on uh, people with disabilities. And uh, these were health professionals uh, and uh, doctors, nurses, and of course, pharmacists and nurses. Now, I gotta get to a question here. Uh, what have we learned from the history, you know, of the past? Because most of us have been in institutions. And how can we, and how can we uh, tell the 
the future advocates, you know, about this. And then lastly, uh, in about 50 or 60 years, are all of our rights going to be, uh, you know, are we all going to have our rights? Right? I know, and, I'm not going to be here in 50 or 60 years. I wish I was, but that's not going to happen. Look, we have our rights. They're not necessarily being implemented. And there are more laws that we need to make um, to end discrimination and have it enforced. I think, you know, your, your point is a very important one. Um, I think working with younger disabled people, we were talking about this yesterday, uh, Sophia and uh, EJ, um, because I, I think many of you um, who participate in this group are people like in your 30s, 40s and older, and younger people are not necessarily involved. I think looking at ways of working with younger disabled people uh, listening to each other, looking at how you can support each other. I think that's very important. You know, you all have a lot of experience um, that other people, younger people don't necessarily have. And they've got experience that, you know, we don't have. So, you know, maybe looking at a meeting where people come together to talk about what are the issues they're trying to work on. See where there's areas of commonality and you can work together. Um, and I do think also working with the Centers for Independent Living um, is very important. There are quite a number of them in New York State and uh, other advocacy groups. But really um, looking at ways of having discussions, even though right now we can't get together in person, you know, you can do Zoom calls. You, you know, you could have a meeting which brings people together um, to talk about, as I said, what, are, what, do you eat, what do you all see as the barriers you're facing? What have you learned? How can you work together? Yeah. Vanessa, are you next? Yeah, um, hi, my name is Vanessa Nelson. I'm from um, Brooklyn. And I, uh, this is so weird that we're doing this over too, but this is great. Yeah. This is great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Vanessa. I don't mean to cut you off. Actually, you're, you're not on our list. And we have like a lot of people ahead of you. Um, I, I apologize. Um, but we have people that actually raised their hands. Um, um, and you, you weren't put on my list. So I don't know if you had your hand up. Um, we, and maybe we didn't see you. Oh, because I just got in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize, but we do have a long list and we want to try to get to as many people as we can. I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, so we have Bernarda is next, actually. Hi, Judy. It's Bernarda. Hi. You're muted. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Hi, Judy. My name is Bernardo Rivera. I'm a self-advocate board member for Sandy. Um, I have a question for you. Um, you muted again. Somebody muted her. No, I can't really okay. Hello? 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 Yes, I got it. Go ahead, Bernardo. Okay. Um, I'm a board member for Sandy's and um, I live on Staten Island, in New York, and I'm doing a Zoom rally on the 9th. Um, it's about my program and the funding they're trying to take away from us from the state. And they're trying to take away our housing issue. Um, I seen a piece of your video just now and I'm really liking what you're doing. And if you can um, come join me at the rally, um, on the 9th at 11, if you can, if it's not in your schedule, but we can try to meet up together and we can talk about issues that maybe you're facing with other self-advocates around you, your friends, your whoever. Um, I can share you my phone number or your phone number. We can talk. Um, we need somebody like you to come out to Staten Island and uh, represent- regarding Bernarda, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but maybe you and Judy can talk offline so we can get to some other people, okay? 
can I suggest in Bernada, um, Bernada maybe um, <laughs> Sophia or someone could, I, I don't know what my schedule is next week. So Sophia knows how to reach me. And Sophia, can you contact Bernada and we can see if it's possible? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Judy, uh, uh, BJ and Bernarda are both on the board together. So okay, BJ great. and Bernarda, yeah, BJ can also help connect. You. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to my behind the scenes people um, to tell me do we want to continue to go um, with Just questions? Just a couple more minutes because I have to get off also. Do Do you? Okay. So so let's. Um, I know we have a lot of people that, that want to talk to Judy and maybe we can send questions to Judy later or something. So let's, let's give, let's do, we're going to do two more people. And I apologize to all of the other people that didn't get their questions done. Um, but let's go to Steve Fleischer. Hey, Judy, my name is Steve Fleischer. And I just want to say something, you are doing what you get that in, but what you get for people with disability are amazing. And I'm particularly, I got to meet you, Julie. Thank you. And I want to say that all of you that are on this call are also amazing. And by that, I mean, you know, you're on the call, you're involved in an organization, you're doing work, you're making changes and together every little change helps. So thank you very much. Okay, so I would like to say I'm sorry, um, Shamika, um, Shamika, sorry. Um, someone on, we don't need to answer the question, but someone raised an issue of abuse in uh -huh. the chat room. So if someone could follow up with that. Yes, anything, anything. I know there was some questions, oh, a couple of questions typed in the chat. So we can go back and we can see if there's anything that we need to address um, afterwards. Yes. Um, so let's, Thank you. Um, yes, no problem. Um, so let's go, we'll go, our last question will be to Sam Maddow. Hi, Judy. Um, my name is Sam Maddow. I'm the executive director for the Center for Self-Advocacy in Buffalo, a peer one organization. Um, I just wanted your opinion on the education uh, two people, youth with disabilities on the ADA with an education system because um, from what I know, they're not getting educated about the ADA. Any question is? Okay. The, should the education system be responsible for uh, teaching children, youth with disabilities okay. about the ADA? The great, uh, it's a great point. Um, you get called Samuel or Sam? Uh, you can call me Sam. Okay. Uh, so let me say a couple things. I think I learned about your organization yesterday when I was um, uh, prepping for today. And um, you have a, a quite a number of younger people involved, right, with your group? Yeah. Yes, yes, I do. Yeah, so I'm glad that you're on this call. And I think one of the previous speakers was um, talking about, you know, working together. I just want to really emphasize that. Now, getting to your point about education, um, and are you talking about like primary, secondary, higher education, everything? Um, middle, middle school, high school. Okay, so um, there is the IDEA, there is 504, there is ADA. And it goes without saying that disabled children, preschool, primary, secondary, and universities are in many cases not getting the services that they're legally entitled to. I think that's definitely something that we can all agree on, including the educational system can agree on that. Now, you and I both understand the importance 
that when people are not getting the services they need, particularly in education, that is going to um, put them in a situation where they're going to be less prepared to be qualified for jobs and a future that is not going to enable them to be as economically independent as they could be. So again, I think a lot of this is working with other groups. So, you know, in New York and in every state, um, there are what are called parent training information centers. I would say it's really important to get involved with them. And uh, if you go to the website and look for information on parent training information centers, if you don't already know the centers in your state, um, I would say reach out to them, learn about what it is they're doing. I think there are many issues. Parents, in many cases, are not knowledgeable about what IDEA is. Um, or they may know about it, but they may need advocates to come with them to the meetings. So looking at ways that people like yourself who can be knowledgeable about the law and can talk with parents and say, you know, would you like me to come with you to an IEP meeting? Or would you like to meet with me in advance to talk about these issues? And particularly when you're talking about kids in high school, you know, mentoring, I think this is so very important to be able to be meeting with kids in elementary school, middle school, and high school who can meet adults with disabilities. That's getting back to the question. I don't remember who asked it, but this is why I think it's so important for things to be intergenerational. Younger people need to understand that you understand, right? You've got experiences that they don't have yet because they're too young and uh, you can help them and their families learn to become advocates learn to be able to go to these IEP meetings and learn to be able to um, be more constructive and more demanding. You know, now that the law requires that at least 15% of rehab dollars go towards transition, it's really also being involved in helping to get the youth and their families much more knowledgeable. And there's so many areas that has to be worked in. So I think it's a great point that you raised. As I said, it goes without saying, I mean, COVID is another whole new challenge because we know in New York and every other state, disabled kids and poor disabled kids um, are being more disadvantaged because they've not been getting the educational services since March. Whatever they were getting before, whether it was poor, medium or great, they're not getting that now. And so it's, we're gonna to have to really look at what to do to help people catch up as well as what to do to help people move forward. And I would say being a part of the discussions, you know, what is going on at the state level at the Department of Education? What is going on in Buffalo with your Department of Education in Buffalo? Um, are you working with parents and kids? Are you in Buffalo? Yeah, we uh, work with the uh, parent network here in uh, Buffalo, and then uh, we have worked with some schools that help uh, kids with disabilities. So I think this is all really important and working together, sharing knowledge. Um, and you know, I, I would love it if the federal government were putting more money into technical assistance. So another thing you may want to do is speak to your congressman or woman, and as a, as a statewide group, and to Schumer, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting her name, the other senator now, and really um, talk with them about what some of the issues are in the state around disability. And you may want to emphasize wanting more money in the area of technical assistance, both for the IDEA and ADA and 504 training. There used to be money more money that was being put into actually training people on what these laws were and how to implement them. So I think there are a lot of possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Judy, before you go, would you like to plug your book? Oh, sure. Hold on. And I'd like you all to plug the book. So um, I have a book which came out and I don't know, Arnold, Sophia, um, 
BJ. This is the book. It's called Being Human, an Unrepentant Memoir of a Disability Rights Activist. And for those of you who like to read, um, you can get it. Many of the bookstores now sell it, or you can, you know, in your communities, you can call them, and many of them are mailing books. Or um, you can go to online to Barnes and Noble or to um, Amazon. The book is also in audio. So for those of you who prefer to listen to the book, um, it's written by, I'm sorry, it's read by a woman named Ali Stroker. And Ali Stroker, some of you also may know, she's a disabled woman and she's the first actor to uh, perform on Broadway in a, using a wheelchair. And she won a Tony Award in uh, 2018 uh, for a best revival in a musical female performer. And so she reads the book and um, it's great. So if you want to do the audio, you can do it that way. You can buy it, you can go to the library. Um, maybe it's something that you could do as a group to read the book and have the discussion about it. So thank you very much um, for raising that, PJ. Thank you very much, Judy. I love you so much. Thank you, guys. This has been great, really great. And I hope. I want to say one more thing. Judy, no, you're amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, all, guys. Thank you. We're, uh, we're so happy that uh, you joined us, Judy. We apologize for not getting to more questions. You know, maybe we can have you in a different setting at, at a different time to get uh, some more. Questions. That'd be great. So, to chat to chat with you so um we want to thank judy and so now we are going to go into a 10 minute break um so we can transition into our next um workshop we are a little bit behind but hopefully um we can make up in uh some other areas but we wanted to get every you know as many people as possible because i know a lot of people wanted to talk to judy today thank you so much guys this was great for me Bye. Thank you, Shamik. Thank you. Bye.